you can change your gut microbiota and the, your gut health within a very short space of time, like even within days within by days. changing your diet. The amygdala processes emotions like fear, stress, anxiety, these kind of like primal emotions. When you have a gut that is happier because there's more diversity of the bacteria that live there, that actually leads to better health in the rest of the body, including the brain. We've given healthy volunteers a specific bifidobacterium, put them through a stressful laboratory testing scenario. We showed that a bifidobacterium, if it was given beforehand, was able to blunt the stress response. Wow. And this is in healthy volunteers. Hi, my name is Rongan Chatterjee. Welcome to Feel Better, Live More. This week's episode is something a little bit different. Over the past few months, I've been experimenting with releasing the odd compilation episode where my team and I clip some of the best bits of previous conversations all around a single topic. Now, the feedback to these episodes so far has been really fantastic, and so we have decided to work on a few more of them. So far, we've covered topics such as brain health and mindset, but the topic for today's special compilation episode is the health of our guts. Now, over the past few years on the podcast, I have had the pleasure of speaking about the importance of gut health with some incredible experts, including neuroscientists, immunologists, nutritionists, and clinical researchers. And in today's episode, we have pulled together some of the very best clips. And modern research is clearly demonstrating that the health of our guts is closely related to our physical health, our mental health, our immune systems, how we respond to stress, and so much more. And I've seen time and time again with my patients that taking simple steps to improve their gut's health can have a profound impact on their overall health. My team and I really enjoyed putting this episode together and hope you enjoy listening. Now, before we get started, just a quick shout out to one of today's sponsors. Vivo Barefoot is on a mission to make footwear that is perfect for our feet, human movement, and planetary health. Now, if you've listened to the podcast for a while, you will know that I have been wearing Vivo Barefoot shoes now exclusively for many years. I think it's over eight years now. And I was wearing them well before they started supporting my podcast. And they honestly have really transformed my life and that of many of my friends and patients. So many people have reported back to me all kinds of benefits, such as less hip pain, knee pain, back pain, foot pain, as well as improved general mobility. And there's actually more and more research coming out to support this. Recently, the University of Liverpool published a study showing that after six months of daily activity in minimal footwear like Vivo Barefoots, foot strength increased by almost 60%. That is incredible. And if I'm honest, doesn't actually surprise me because I've seen and experienced the benefits firsthand. Dr. Irene Davis at Harvard is someone who I spoke to recently at an online barefoot conference. And she explained to me how our natural gait as humans changes as soon as we put on cushioned shoes, resulting in more torque going through the knee. And I genuinely believe that in a few years' time, we're going to look back and wonder why did we think it was such a good idea to put kids and adults in heavily cushioned shoes? Now, Vivo have a great range of shoes for kids and adults, and for every activity, from hiking to training to everyday wear. They are the only shoes that my wife and I wear and the only shoes that I get for my children. If you have never tried them before, I really would encourage you to give them a go. It is completely risk-free to do so because they offer a 100-day trial for new customers. So if you're not happy, you can simply send them back for a full refund. For listeners of my show, they continue to offer a fantastic discount. If you go to vivobarefoot.com forward slash live more, they are giving 20% off as a one-time code for all of my podcast listeners in the UK, USA, and Australia. You can get your 20% off code by going to vivobarefoot.com forward slash live more. 
We begin this episode with the clinical researcher, gut expert and author, Dr. Michael Ruscio. In this clip from episode 63 of the podcast, he spoke about his own personal experience of ill health and the eventual unexpected diagnosis that gave him a very valuable learning experience. I was in college and my focus was exercise kinesiology and and pre-medical. And and so I was pretty ensconced in in kind of health and, and medicine and nutrition. And because of that, I had all the dietary and lifestyle factors pretty dialed in. And I had always felt well throughout my entire life. I was also a college athlete. Yet, all of a sudden, I started having insomnia, brain fog, fatigue, depression. I was having all these symptoms for a reason I could not determine. And it was very disheartening to not feel well because it was the first time in my life I hadn't felt well. But I figured, well, you know, I want to be a doctor. This is what doctors do. So I'll go see a doctor and they'll, they'll figure this out. And I saw three different doctors and they all said, you're really healthy. Your, your tests look normal. You've got a good body composition, good blood sugar, good cholesterol. And I remarked, well, okay, (laughs) that's, that's, Great, but can can you offer me any reason why I'm having this insomnia, why I'm waking up multiple times per night, unable to fall back to sleep, why uh, why I am tired during the day, why I have these bouts of brain fog and low mood that I've never had before? And none of them had an answer. And so that led me to look for other options. And I found a clinician who who later kind of became my mentor and he suggested the idea that I may have had an intestinal infection. And I remember thinking, this guy has to be crazy because I didn't have diarrhea. I didn't have abdominal pain. I didn't have any of those symptoms. But at that point, I didn't have anything to lose. So I said, okay, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll look into this and, you know, I'll do the stool test that you're recommending. I did the test. I had an infection in my intestines, an amoeba actually, and it was treating that infection that led to a resolution of my symptoms. Before I got that diagnosis, I went on the internet, I read about adrenal fatigue, about hypothyroidism, about metal toxicity. And I kind of self-diagnosed myself with all these conditions. And I tried different protocols for adrenal support, for thyroid support, um, for metal detox. And I'd see a little flicker of improvement, but nothing really long lasting. Not until I addressed the true cause of the symptoms, which was this infectious inflammatory issue in my intestines. And it was only by treating that that I saw a long lasting and and permanent resolution of my symptoms. And that really taught me that when someone's not feeling well, we want to make sure to look at their gut first. It's, It's not a guarantee, but if we were to have an order of operations in terms of what should we do first? after diet and lifestyle, I think it's it's a very tenable recommendation to say, do a check for your gut, make sure everything there is squared away. Because for many people, and my clinical experience has, has definitely reinforced this as true, the issue that's causing their symptoms, even if they're not digestive symptoms, even if it's only joint pain or fatigue or insomnia, could be a problem in their gut. Modern research is now really establishing this connection. We know of the gut-brain connection, the gut-skin connection, the gut-joint connection, the gut-thyroid connection. Uh, So you can have a digestive problem that is not manifesting digestively and is only manifesting in other symptoms outside of the gut. Our food choices affect not only our gut's health, but also the health of our brains. And my next guest, the nutritionist and clinical neuroscientist, Miguel Mateus, has worked on multiple clinical trials to assess the impact of consuming fermented foods like kefir and sauerkraut on our guts as well as our brains. In this clip from episode 33, we explored the gut-brain connection and why diversity is key. What is the link then between the gut and our brain? The gut is connected with the brain through this cable. I like to call it uh, like an internet cable, like a LAN cable. So you've got your Wi-Fi and you've got your LAN cable. You've got this LAN cable that's giving you very powerful 
connectivity with the brain that's not dependent on the modem going off or anything. You've got <laughs> that you know, physical cable connecting the gut and the brain. And the cable is called the vagus nerve. It's a physical cable that if you actually split somebody open, it's there. And it ends up in um, an, a part of the brain called the amygdala. And the amygdala processes emotions like fear, stress, anxiety, these kind of like primal emotions. So this having a gut feeling, what we talk about having a gut feeling or having a hunch or having an intuition that starts with butterflies in the stomach, is actually your gut telling you that you've picked up a signal that something is going to happen. When you have a gut that is more that is happier because there's more diversity of the bacteria that live there, the bugs are more varied, they, uh, the gut wall is working better, so there's less permeability, there's less leaky gut. That actually leads to better health in the rest of the body, including the brain. We all know that a poor diet negatively impacts our physical health, but the effects on our mental health can also be devastating. Professor Felice Jacker is a world-leading expert in the field of nutritional psychiatry. And in episode 74, she told me about her groundbreaking research into the link between food and our moods. The SMILES trial that you did, literally, I think, will go down as being one of the most game-changing trials in terms of research on diet and mental health. I think it's incredible and it's helping to give real weight uh, globally to the, the notion that our diet can improve our mood and our mental health. I designed it when I was a very early postdoc, the SMILES trial. We recruited people with major clinical depression and we randomly assigned them to get either social support or dietary support. Now, the social support, we already know that that's helpful for people with depression. Yeah. And then the other group saw a clinical dietitian for three months. And that dietitian just worked with those people to help them to gradually make positive changes to their diet, to set some goals, to do it in a way that was feasible and achievable for them, swapping out their, you know, refined carbs, their white flour, white bread, et cetera, for whole grain versions, um, increasing the amount of vegetables and fruit in their diet, starting to eat more legumes, so your lentils and chickpeas, et cetera, having some nuts and seeds, eating fish, getting some olive oil into their diet, but also really importantly, reducing the intake of, you know, the junk and processed foods. And at the end of the study, there was just this massive difference in the depression scores. And we were just completely blown away. How big a difference? Well, uh, to put it into, a, I guess, a, a meaningful context, more than 30% of the people in the dietary group achieved what we would call full remission, where they just weren't depressed at all anymore. And that was compared to about 8% in the social support group. So hold on, that, we, we just got to pause there because that is absolutely remarkable. You, you were talking about people who have got moderate or severe depression. Mm -hmm. If you change your diet... Within 12 weeks, you've got above a 30% remission rate in symptoms mm. of depression. That is absolutely staggering. We've already heard about how the health of our guts can impact our brain health and mental health. But could there also be an impact on stress? My next guest, John Cryan, is a world-leading researcher on the gut-brain axis and a professor of anatomy and neuroscience. In episode 20, he described how the connection between our gut and our brains affects all aspects of our health, including our stress levels. I think humans have intuitively known for many years how various things affect us. You know, the word gut feeling says it already. What have you seen so far that actually makes you feel actually maybe a healthy gut is going to buffer us against stress? You know, what are some of those clues in the research so far? Some of the key things that we found is that when we look at how in animal studies, for example, when we look at how we stratify animals based on different composition of their microbiome, we were able to correlate the changes that we see uh, with specific stress-related responses. So we were interested in how the respiratory system responds to a stressor, and we found that correlated very well with certain microbial species. We also were interested in how um, the cortisol response, the equivalent in animals, how that responds uh, to a stressor, and we were able to make direct correlations there. But wow. some of the best uh, data is emerging now 
also in human studies where we're, uh, we've, for example, given uh, healthy volunteers a specific bifidobacterium and we put them through a stressful laboratory testing uh, scenario. We, we showed that a bifidobacterium, if it was given beforehand, was able to blunt the stress response. Wow. And this is in healthy volunteers. So that was quite remarkable uh, finding. That's very exciting. And, and there's a number of studies now emerging with different strains of uh, probiotics or, or combinations of probiotics that are showing this. So we've heard about probiotics, but what other benefits could they have? And how can we include them in our diets? We'll hear again from Michael Ruscio as he explains the multiple potential health benefits of probiotics. And then Miguel talks about misconceptions that we may have read in the papers and how it's possible to get the benefits of probiotics from certain foods. But first, back in episode five, Dr. Megan Rossi, dietitian and researcher at King's College London and founder of the Gut Health Doctor, talked to me about further research into the role probiotics can play in our response to stressors. When we get our gut working well, it is amazing how many different organs in the body have beneficial effects. It's, it's incredible. It really is. And the, the research coming out at the minute is so exciting, connecting our gut with our brain. So they've randomised people to having a probiotic, they're the good bacteria, versus a placebo, so that's kind of like a fake supplement. And after four weeks having that every day, uh, they found that those who had the actual probiotic, actually they scanned their brain with an MRI machine and they could see that their brain responded quite differently to negative stimuli if they had the probiotic versus those in the placebo, suggesting they're actually able to cope better with some negative things. So, you know, it's, it's such an exciting time, I think, really connecting mental health with gut health. It's fairly safe to say that probiotics have multiple potential health benefits. Two meta-analyses of clinical trials have concluded that probiotics can improve mood. There's a number of meta-analyses showing benefits for irritable bowel syndrome. There's also some evidence showing that probiotics can improve neurological conditions. There's other evidence showing that probiotics may improve skin. There's some evidence showing that probiotics can improve cholesterol and blood pressure. And of course, we know that probiotics can decrease inflammation in the gut. And that may be why we see probiotics having benefit in a number of different systems. Because if the root cause or one of the root causes of many ailments is inflammation in the gut, and by treating the cause, you can see anything from skin to neurological conditions improve. There's just been a a big study talking about probiotics, don't take them, they don't do anything, they don't stay in the gut. Well, it's not big news. We always know that, that probiotics, whether you call them probiotics or live bacteria or whatever, from a yogurt or kefir or a supplement, they go through you and they come out the other end. It's what they do while What's they are there. That? What those probiotics may be doing is whether they are in a food like sauerkraut or kimchi or kefir or yogurt uh, or in a supplement capsule, they may be going through you, but they may be increasing that diversity. They may be facilitating that diversity. I think it's a brilliant point you make, Miguel. And I, I saw that big newspaper report when it yeah. came out, the media were reporting it, the probiotics don't work. And, yeah. and it's it's just not true. Yes, they don't stay in the guts. Yeah. But Many of us who've been studying this for a while, we know that. They, yeah. they exert their effect as they go through and yeah. they change the terrain, they change the environment. Yeah. Uh, and I certainly still do, for some patients, use probiotics with yeah. patients. Yeah. So it's now for practitioners and scientists to start communicating to, the, to lay people who are interested in this kind of stuff, what kind of um, supplements or foods may be rich in the ones that are good for depression or for better mood or cognition or attention or IBS, that kind of stuff. And that's, we're only touching the, the tip of the iceberg. We know that people can increase their well-being. They can feel better after drinking kefir or eating yogurt, for example. So we don't need to get very fancy. It can be very easy 
have a bit of yogurt every day. If you've never had it before, because it was a novel food for you, you'll benefit from it. If you're on the yogurt already and want to be a bit more fancy, have some kefir that is super loaded with bacteria. If you want to be super hipster, have kombucha. Our gut bugs play a vital role in keeping our immune system healthy. And in this next clip from episode 125, the immunologist, Dr. Jenna Machoki explains how our diet can affect our gut bugs and our immune system. A lot of people talk about gut health these days, but I don't think people understand the immune system's linked to, you know, yes, they think the gut is yeah. something separate, but I, I often teach uh, doctors about this triad between our diet our gut bugs mm -hmm. and our immune system and how they all sort of cross talk. Oh, definitely. You know, there's yeah. there's bi-directional communication between, you know, diet and gut bugs, diet and immune system mm -hmm. and gut bugs and immune system together. Yes. It's like this. So, you know, if you, if you make certain dietary choices, you're going to improve mm -hmm. the health of your gut bugs, which is going to improve the health of your immune system. Yes, exactly. Just empowering, right? Because yep. we can do something about that. Yes. Your gut bugs, the microbiota at the interface of your digestion and the rest of your body are one of the key educators of the immune system. And again, this is something that's probably exploded in the field of, of immunology in yeah. the last 10, 15 years. So if you take a, an experimental animal model where the animals have a, a reduced or a minimal um, collection of good bacteria in their gut, their immune system doesn't develop and they're very impaired in how they can respond and heal. Um, and even things like, you know, protection from cancer because our immune system is the main cancer surveillance system. So these bugs are helping to educate and teach and mature our immune system. And this happens potentially in utero before we're born, but uh, predominantly when we enter the world, because we go from a relatively sterile, there is some evidence that there may be yeah. some bugs in the placenta. Uh, but we go into this hugely germy world and suddenly our immune system has to cope with that because it's got all these receptors on it to, to detect pathogens as being problematic. So it has to learn to tolerate those because, you know, most of the bugs around us are safe and harmless and we need them because they're helping us. And, and that's actually how the immune system develops, isn't it? Mm -hmm. It is by exposure mm -hmm. to the environment around it, to exactly. the bugs around it, to sort of give it that sort of ongoing education yeah. so it starts to learn, oh, I respond to this. I yeah. don't need to respond to that. Exactly. Um, I often say that, you know, the immune system's made, it's not born. There's maybe a percentage in the genetics that we inherit, but then it's made, it's built throughout our life and it changes throughout our life. So that's a lovely idea. It's yeah. made, not born. We can, we can build and we can sort of develop it mm -hmm. the way we want to if we give it if the we, right yeah. inputs. inputs. Yeah. These bacteria, they help protect the gut barrier to keep it very nice and, and tight and stop any bacteria going into the body because they're only good bacteria if they're in the right location. So they're not meant to cross over the gut and enter our body yeah. um, because then they, they become a problem. But one of the biggest things that they're doing to help our immune system is they're, they're eating our food. And I often think your diet's only as good as your microbiota in your gut because yeah. they are, they're the interface. They're eating your food. They're helping you to produce these vitamins and minerals from your diet, but they're also producing these postbiotics. Um, and people might have heard of prebiotics and probiotics, but postbiotics are basically the metabolic waste of the bugs in your gut. So they're producing stuff. That is their kind of, you know, waste product of eating your foods. Like short chain fatty acids. Short chain fatty acids yeah. is the classic one. I, I used to work on these when I lived in Switzerland um, and looking at how they influence um, inflammation in the gut and beyond. So short chain fatty acids are kind of a metabolic byproduct of the, the bugs in your gut. And they directly bind to uh, the immune cells at that site and they help 
educate them and teach them to sort of tolerate anything that you're throwing down your mouth because we're not supposed to um, react to that because it should be, you know, benign things that are going in there. But they have to help strike that balance that if you did get some kind of food poisoning, they also can identify the bad bugs. Yeah. So they help create an environment that's what we call tolerogenic. So it's encouraging um, tolerance of the food that you're eating. And there's a very kind of dynamic interaction between these bugs and the immune cells. And I'd say what happens in the gut is not just staying there. This um, influence, this sort of tolerogenic influence of yeah. things like short-chain fatty acids is also being absorbed into your bloodstream and helping regulate the immune system. One of the key things that is often not linked to your immune system, but I'd say it's like massive for the, the resilience of your immune system is fiber. So pills and, and potions and whatever are not full of fiber, but the fresh produce is full of fiber. And People might be thinking, why is fiber important for your immune system? Different bugs need different forms of fiber. And it, we find it in all the plant-based foods. So it's not just the fruits and vegetables, nuts and seeds, legumes, beans, pulses, and, and whole grains. Yeah. And it's about trying to bring in the diversity. I think in the last few years, there's a, a publication about the sort of th trying to get 30 different plant-based foods yeah. into your diet because it's, per it's about per week. Yeah, because it's about the diversity. But that also, it's that includes, I think, lentils and mm -hmm. nuts. Yeah. Uh, you know, it, you know I, I think it's very achievable yeah. once people have it in their mind. Exactly, to, yeah. To do it. And they're very common in, in traditional diets. I remember growing up, you know, my mum would would add lots of different um, grains and beans and pulses to spin things out, as she put it, so that you yeah. could make a dish go a lot further. And so now that's something that I do as well. Lots of different colours, lots mm -hmm. of different diversity of plants is going to help your gut microbiome, it's going to mm -hmm. help your immune system. Mm -hmm. So, have we lost touch with where our food actually comes from? Well, coming up next, Felice Jacket explains why eating a wide variety of plant foods is important for gut health and the benefits of real whole grains. But first, all the way back in episode one, my guest was Tim Spector, professor of genetic epidemiology at King's College London, a medical doctor and author of the fantastic books, The Diet Myth and Spoon Fed. Tim told me about the time he spent with the Hadza tribe in Tanzania. Are there some key lessons that people can learn from what the Hadza have done and what you have found there? You don't have to be rich to have a good gut health. These oh. guys have no money. They basically just forage for a few hours a day and they, they're happy to eat what their ancestors have been eating for tens of thousands of years. And for them, their environment is a bit like a supermarket. They just get out there and um, take their berries in the morning, eat the animals. They don't waste anything. They have f four or five times the amount of fiber we do. They're naturally getting fiber from pretty much everything they eat. They also have lots of berries, and so, so they have these wild berries. They're tiny, but they have probably five times the fiber and five times the polyphenols, or 10, 20 times the polyphenols that we do. Microbes then convert that polyphenol into a very useful chemical, which can then do lots of things like help our immune systems. It can relax the vessel walls for your heart. It can send signals to your brain. All kinds of stuff. It's almost as if good health is happening for them by default of the way they're living lives, rather than thinking we need to do this to be healthy. The way that they live and the way that they eat, which has been passed down from generation to generation, as a natural consequence of that, they're in good health. Yeah, absolutely. There's no concept really yeah. of, of health. It's what it is and that's what they do. These people have been there for at least 50,000 years without moving because they know that around the baobab tree will produce the pods for 11 months a year, the berries grow. It's an easy life. And, and actually, in a way, by chance, it's providing them with, with this perfect balance of food that we perhaps need to re emulate. If we compare, you know, very simplistically, their microbiomes to our Western microbiomes, some studies are suggesting we may have lost about 50% of the diversity. Is that, is that fair to say? Yeah. Is that what you found? Yeah, it's around 40%, but it, it's substantial numbers. And they have many microbes that we just don't see at all in the West. 
I think fibre is a really important thing because yeah, we we're eating a lot less fibre than these than these tribes are eating, and mm. that particular types of fibre are the best food for these gut bugs that live inside us, right? We don't really know enough about all the fibres at the moment about how they work, but what's clear is that you want a diversity of fibre because. Not all microbes feed off the same fiber. There are some fibers we know about are useful. There's one called inulin, and the microbes use that as a, a massive sort of energy source. And so choosing foods that are high in inulin in terms of the fiber, we definitely know that's useful. These are things like Jerusalem artichokes, leeks, onions, garlic, and a little bit in bananas. So could it be that in the modern Western world where the majority of the junk food we're having, a huge part of that is refined and processed carbohydrates. Could it be that when we cut those out, we're removing the junk out of our diets? Is that part of the picture? If you blitz it and in in pasteurize it and it comes out of a plastic microwave packet, you're not going to have that contact with your food. So real food is important. I think diversity is important. Yeah. And there's not many examples of really healthy populations that just have four or five ingredients every single day, which is what people who are living existing mainly on supermarket, cheap, ready meals and processed foods are having. We already know what sort of diet is consistently linked to longevity. And that's a diet that is high in plant foods and high in a diversity of plant foods because the more diverse your diet the more diverse your gut microbiome, and that seems to be a marker of gut health. Yeah. The bacteria in your gut in particular, very, very simply speaking, they break down the fibrous foods that our human enzymes can't break down. So fiber is found in plant foods, things such as vegetables, fruits, whole grain cereals, legumes, your beans and lentils, etc. So all sorts of different types of plant foods have dietary fiber. The gut microbes break that down by a, a process of fermentation. And in that process of fermentation, they produce many, many, many metabolites. And it's the production of these metabolites that seems to be so important. And we know that they, for example, interact with every cell in the body. Whole grains have become quite a controversial area in, in the diet wars. And I think that's because often what we consider to be whole grains are not whole grains. Mm. Um, so I think it's quite clear that there's pretty good research suggesting that real whole grains can have beneficial impacts on your gut microbiome and consequently on your overall health, including your moods. Um, what do you see the problem with whole grains? Is, is it that interpretation? Is it that we, the food industry are marketing refined grains as whole grains? Yes, Basically, yes. And I think, you know, people in, in the US where their food system is just so broken and has been is. for decades to the point where nobody alive today in the US remembers what normal food looks like. I mean, it really is, it's, it's a rarity. And for them, whole grain might be a brown bread that's still highly refined and full of all sorts of things. But if you look at certainly the epidemiological data, whole grain intake is at, out of all of the food groups, the most strongly associated with improved health outcomes. If you look at the gut and what we know so far, whole grains, and here we're talking about things like oats and barley and frica and spelt and, and buckwheat and brown rice. So things that are true whole grains are just a really valuable source of fiber for that fermentation process of, of the gut. But they're also anti-inflammatory. My recommendation is just try and avoid the ultra-processed foods and have as much diversity in, of whole foods as you can. And so what we call a plant-predominant diet. Just taking a quick break to give a shout out to some of today's sponsors who are especially relevant for the health of our guts. The Mental Wellness App Calm are sponsoring today's show. And as you are finding out in this episode, stress can play havoc with your gut's health and is a key thing to get under control if we want to improve the health of our guts. So consider this sponsor read as your mental health checkpoint. How are you feeling at the moment? Have you been anxious recently? Have you felt stressed? How has your sleep been? You know, we all struggle from time to time and it's absolutely okay to need a bit of help. 
And this is where Calm can really provide support. Calm is the number one mental wellness app to give you the tools that improve the way you feel. You can clear your head with guided daily meditations, improve your focus with Calm's curated music tracks, and drift off to dreamland with Calm's imaginative sleep stories. Over 100 million people around the world use Calm to take care of their minds, Sleep more, stress less, live better with Calm. For listeners of the show, Calm is offering a special limited time promotion of 40% off a Calm premium subscription at calm.com forward slash live more, which includes hundreds of hours of programming and new content is added every week. Go to calm.com forward slash live more for 40% off unlimited access to Calm's entire library. That's Calm, C-A-L-M dot com forward slash live more. Athletic Greens are also sponsoring today's show. And as you've already heard, nutrition is very important for the health of our guts. Now, Athletic Greens make one of the most nutrient-dense whole food supplements that I have ever come across. And you're hearing already on this episode about the importance of diversity For our gut's health, Athletic Greens contains many different whole food ingredients to really help out in this area, but it also contains vitamins, minerals, digestive enzymes, prebiotics, and probiotics, which of course we are hearing about on the show. Now in an ideal world, everybody would get all of their nutrition from real whole food, but the truth is, as I have seen time and time again with many of my patients, that many of us struggle to consistently do that. That is why I am a fan of Athletic Greens and take it regularly myself. If you want to take something each morning as an insurance policy to make sure that you are meeting your nutritional needs, I can highly recommend it. For listeners of the show, if you go to athleticgreens.com forward slash live more, you will be able to access a new special offer where you get 10 free travel packs with your subscription. You can check it out at athleticgreens.com forward slash live more. As we've already heard, the health of our gut microbiome is key to our overall health. We'll now hear once again from John, who gives his thoughts on the importance of our relationship with our microbes. It's very hard not to feel that once we understand the gut microbiome more and more, we'll see that that is really the intersection point for many different conditions. Absolutely. But, you know, you could have a cynical view on that too. And people have often addressed this to me, like, is there anything that the microbiome is not involved in? But my response is always this, is that we have to remember that the microbes were there first. And there has never been a time where our brain or our body has existed without signals coming from microbes. So if we understand and can step back and and not be so human cell centric and try and think of it from an evolutionary perspective, we have co-evolved with these microbial friends and they have helped us benefit from many, many things. I guess in the last 50 years, because of modern living and a lot of modern practices, we're starting to decimate the populations of those microbes. So arguably, we're now entering a time where maybe for the first time in our evolutionary history, we might be living without the presence of certain microbes. Professor Sachin Panda of the Salk Institute in California is one of my most popular previous guests on the podcast. He's a world-leading expert in the field of circadian rhythms, and in episode 81... He explained how time-restricted eating can help reduce inflammation in our guts and improve many other aspects of our health. In this clip, he describes some of the incredible findings of his research. Nearly 50% of adults in Western countries eat for 15 hours or longer. So that means if their first cup of tea with milk and sugar happens at 6 o'clock in the morning, then the last sip of wine or last sip of milk might happen at nine o'clock at night or later. Almost one-tenth of our stomach lining is repaired and replaced every night. 
And just like you cannot repair a highway when the cars and trucks are moving, we cannot repair our uh, gut if we eat at night. The most obvious circadian rhythm that we all experience is the daily sleep-wake cycle. But that's just uh, the tip of the iceberg. And there are many other rhythms that go on inside our body. We wanted to test this very simple idea. If our liver, if our gut is better primed to digest and use these nutrients at a certain time, is it better if we align eating time to that time? And we know that when we sleep, our gut is not functioning well. It's not primed for digestion. We did a simple experiment where we divided the mice to two groups. One group got to eat this high-fat, high-sucrose diet whenever they want. And the other group got the same unhealthy diet, but that was aligned to their circadian rhythm. So they ate all that food within eight hours in the first experiment and then later in 10 to 11 hours. So these two groups of mice were eating the same number of calories from the same food. But to our surprise, the mice that ate within 8 to 10 hours were completely protected from all these diseases, obesity, type 2 diabetes, fatty liver disease, high cholesterol, and cardiovascular disease. If you align your eating time with your circadian rhythm, when your liver, when your gut is primed to digest that food, has this huge health benefit. It's actually, that's, that's just incredible. Just, just to highlight that, you're saying that the mice had the same diet, the same amount of calories, simply the time that they had them was restricted. We repeated this experiment three, four times before I could really believe it because this goes right against what we know in nutrition research for the last 150 years. Clinicians and nutritionists are already putting this research into action. And in episode 40, the author and nutritional therapist Jeanette Hyde explained the benefits that she is already seeing in her patients. The microbiome will flourish and have more diversity just being by not having food sort of charging through it you know all day long yeah and so it, what happens it's like i say to people it's like think of it like a lawn you need to not walk over it for a few hours let it have time to, to flourish and thrive yeah, that's a great analogy for the big cases like inflammatory bowel disorder and stuff like that and also diverticulitis and and some of the really bad ibs cases i start by saying do a 16 hour fast with an eight hour window so that's eight first. hours in the daytime where but they would they, eat yeah, food within. Yeah, yeah. And, and do that for the first month. So, for instance, let's say somebody tells me they hate breakfast. I leap on that. I leap on that fact. You know, that's one of my key entry points. I'm like, oh, you don't like breakfast? Well, you don't have to eat breakfast. You know? Yeah. <laughs> and they're like, really? I've always been told I've had to eat breakfast, so they don't. So suddenly, instantly, th those kind of people might be very happy to start, you know, 12 eating to late. at 12 to late. Yeah. Generally, time-restricted eating and time-restricted feeding is a very safe recommendation that can impact weight, blood sugar, immune system, inflammation levels, all kinds of things in the body. So it makes sense that when you, when you make that recommendation with a patient, mm. Jeanette, all kinds of different diseases or conditions may start to improve. I've had several of these cases and I, I thought I was just doing it, you know, to regularize the microbiome and get put that in better shape so that is going to have a knock-on impact i wasn't expecting the results as fast as they're coming because of our modern lifestyles problems in the gut are becoming more and more common if you're suffering with irritable bowel syndrome megan and jeanette offer some practical advice There's been some, you know, really powerful studies that have shown they've surveyed quite a large number of people with IBS and shown that on average they'd be happy to give up 25% of their remaining life to be symptom free. Wow. Showing just how debilitating the condition truly is. We know that stress is a huge cause uh, or huge trigger, should I say, of IBS. 
in my clinical practice, often I not only look at things like diet, but I also look at levels of stress and how they can manage that in order to manage their IBS. I have found in you know nearly 17 years now seeing tens of thousands of patients, I found that when I go for this multi-pronged approach, so you know for an IBS patient, maybe making some uh, food suggestions, talking to them about some gentle movement, talking to them about things that they can do to de-stress. I find it's much more effective than actually just going for that magic bullet approach. People can be just sort of focusing really hard on the diet and like have a conversation with somebody and, you know, they're actually seated 12 hours of the day, these IBS patients, you know, yeah. um, driving to work, then being in very sort of demanding jobs and driving home and and it's only as we're talking and they're explaining it to me, I, I might feed it back and go, do you realise you're you're seated for 12 hours a day? And they go, really? I've not really thought about it like that. Do you know what I mean? And I said, you don't, you're not having a lunch break either, are you? And they're like, um, no, I haven't got time for lunch. You know, they're eating at the desk and all that stuff as well. But I physical have... activity is important, right? For well, our guts. Yes, totally. Because, you know, when you're moving, your gut bacteria improves and you produce short chain fatty acids, which help with the gut lining and to keep that repaired and in good shape. So again, moving around if you have IBS is really important. Are there some common themes that you see that people are either not telling you about or that they're doing wrong? I see the food diaries and often it's like wonderful food diaries. Very, very sort of all round diets, eating a good quality breakfast, lunch, dinner, you know, lots of variety. You know, they're doing lots and lots of good things. You want to know what the butt is. The butt is, it's a massive blind spot for a lot of people is the alcohol and wow. binge drinking at the weekend. And these are all walks of life. People who are retired, some people have you know, the high flying jobs and they're drinking a lot of alcohol and they then haven't put, put two and two together that their IBS is terrible all the time. You know, like not even knowing if they're going to make it to the loo on time. You know, the IBS is so bad, so bad. but they've got this kind of big thing, elephant in the room that's not being acknowledged. Some of you may have heard or used something called a low FODMAP diet. But what on earth is a FODMAP? Well, FODMAPs are a group of fermentable carbohydrates that can aggravate gut symptoms in people who are sensitive, and they are found in a wide range of different foods. Now, for some people, reducing FODMAPs really helps them with their gut symptoms. But it's really important for me to emphasize here that a low FODMAP diet is not designed to be a long-term diet. Ideally, you would utilize this diet under the guidance of a trained healthcare professional to make sure that you are addressing any underlying issues. And then, ideally with time, start to reintroduce some of those foods back into your diet. So what are these high FODMAP foods? And how can eliminating them for a short time potentially help our guts to heal? The foods that are high FODMAP, we would stereotype as being healthy. Asparagus, broccoli, avocado, apples. Uh, you know, who would have thought that these foods, when eaten in too high of a level, could actually make you feel worse? But they can. The, the nice thing is that so the solution isn't a hard one. If, if you download a low FODMAP diet list, you can clearly see, okay, here's the vegetables and fruits I want to focus on. Here's the ones I want to be a little bit more careful with. The goal is to use the diet to help the person gain awareness towards what their food triggers are and also allow some healing in the gut to occur. And then you can broaden your diet and move to the most diverse diet possible. For some people with, with highly compromised guts, they may always be sensitive to some FODMAPs, and that's okay. There's kind of this nuance, this balance. We don't want to blindly follow the low FODMAP diet forever. We want to use it for a short term, heal, and then reintroduce and try to have the broadest diet possible, but also be okay with the fact that there may be a few high FODMAP foods that you don't tolerate. And, and don't stress out if you can't introduce some high FODMAP foods without any symptoms. As we've heard, the health of our guts has implications for our overall health and happiness. Research is finding new links connecting our gut's health to many different health conditions. But there is still so much more to learn. 
Felice, John and Tim give us their thoughts on what the future may hold. We know that the gut microbiome is so important for our immune system, for our metabolism and body weight, for our, our, the, our brain health and right across the board. And there's a huge amount of research that's being done across the world now in this field, which is wonderful because it means that we're getting advances in our knowledge very quickly. But at this point, what we know is that diet is the most important thing that affects the gut microbiota and that you can change your gut microbiota and the, your gut health within a very short space of time, like even within days within by days. changing your diet. And that's such a powerful um, you know, thing to understand. This knowledge that these bacteria that have co-evolved with us have such an important role in our health is really giving us some new insights that we can act on to, I think, improve a lot of health outcomes. We all have blood tests now. Do you think there will be a point in the future where we all might have our microbiome tested as a sort of baseline to see what we need to improve on? I really think so. I really wow. think so. And, and uh, I, as a GP, I think this will be part of your reality uh, within the next five or so years because the costs are coming down. The knowledge about what it means is, is, is going up. And so we're able to use large data sets like the um, American Gut Project, which published a huge paper outlining you know, what the American microbiome looks like. And if you have enough metadata, so information about po at a population, level, you can start to ascribe changes. And there they were able to look at specific bacteria that were uh, implicated in certain uh, uh, mental diseases and particularly in relation to depression. So we're beginning to see more and more of this. I think what we're going to have is in the whole field of nutritional psychiatry moving forward is that we, we will be able to target individuals with specific diets that will A, suit their symptoms, B, suit their microbiomes, uh, and, and, and hopefully relieve some of their underlying uh, pathology. The progress just in three to five years has been amazing. And we're now starting to see this, the microbiome is becoming part of mainstream medicine. I think this is the most exciting bit of science today. It's the most relevant for public health. It's changing every week. And so that's what I love about it. We finish off with some great tips from all of my guests to help you improve your gut health for better physical and mental health. Make sure that if your symptoms are really quite debilitating, you do see your GP and rule out things like celiac disease and inflammatory bowel disease. Then the next thing I think is getting individualised advice. There's so many different therapies out there um, and each different therapy could actually be beneficial for different types of symptoms. I think uh, for those with IBS with less severe symptoms, one of the big keys is trying to stress less. So look at ways to relax. Make sure when you are eating, you chew your food at least 20 times per mouthful and, and little simple things like that to kind of go a little bit slower and let your digestive tract kind of relax and get ready for the food that it's about to receive. Don't forget to slow down. And I think it's, you know, especially in westernized societies, it's, it's so easy to get swept into always working, thinking, and doing. Taking that time for stillness, for reflection, is so important to help you key in on, maybe you're not happy with a certain thing in your life, and maybe you're just kind of running from that and distracting yourself in this never-ending litany of stimulation. A little bit of stillness time and a little bit of thankfulness can go a long way in helping to make sure that you don't just get caught up in this runaway uh, syndrome of trying to have more, be more, and do more. Diversity actually goes further than just dietary diversity. If you have a life that's more diverse in experiences, that's also playing a role in keeping your brain engaged. It's probably going to play a role in keeping you less stressed. And because you're going to be less stressed and less anxious, it's likely to make you feel happier than if you do the same thing every day. When there is flexibility in the behavior, we adapt better to whatever may come next because we are more flexible, we are more plastic. We can take things that life throws at us in a, in a more gracious way. 
maybe keep a, a diary about your drinking because I think that a lot of us we don't realize till we actually see it in black and white how much we are drinking alcohol yes and I think that you know especially in IBS or if you've got a weight issue it's a big factor so do you know it's just worth seeing it in black and white and sometimes that can you know you start to have a conversation with yourself about well actually maybe my partner and I we will we'll try and do this that or the other it's much easier to drink less if you've if you've got support and you know you're supporting each other Try and increase the diversity of the diet. Fermented foods, they can be quite exotic things like kimchi and kefir and uh, kombucha, but also yogurts and sauerkraut and various things like that. We know that they're going to be, have beneficial effects on, on uh, the bacteria that we want to see thriving in the gut. We know that increasing uh, the prebiotic, the fibers, the uh, inulins, the green vegetables, that's very clear, positive things we can do to our microbiome. What you eat really does matter to your mental and brain health in the short term as well as the long term. So pay attention to it, you know, and it doesn't need to be expensive or fussy or difficult. It can just be really basic peasant food, you know, uh, cooked up without much in the way of complex recipes. It really does help. And getting regular exercise. If I don't exercise, I don't sleep properly and everything falls apart. So finding something that you really like doing, whether it's just big walks in the park or um, resistance training or whatever it is, just try and move because that has such a flow on benefit to everything else. Have much more fiber than you're currently having. Forget all bran, uh, <laughs> talk about you know, diverse fibers. And by getting fibers naturally, it's grains, it's vegetables. It's a variety of fibers that you want. Polyphenols are crucially important, so learn which foods have high polyphenol contents, teach the rest of the family, go with colors. The rainbow is a nice analogy to think about that. And you'll be surprised at what foods do have these polyphenols. I think not snacking and giving your gut a rest yeah. is crucial. Listen to your body. Most of the world doesn't have breakfast. If you're the kind of person who can skip breakfast, that's the easy way to do it. Above all, embrace diversity. Pick different things to eat and your microbes will love you for it. Really hope you enjoyed that special compilation episode. Just a quick note to say that I do recognise that some of those tips can be challenging for some people to put into practice. Those who have had long-term gut issues can sometimes find that adding in some of those foods recommended can be uncomfortable and cause flare-ups and symptoms such as bloating and cramps. So if you think that may apply to you, it really can be worth seeking out a trained healthcare professional to help you out. But please do not forget about stress. For me, it is the number one cause of gut problems and there really are so many simple things that you can do each day that really do make a difference. I've talked about this in previous podcasts. I've also covered them probably in each and every single one of my books. The ones most specific to this area are probably the Stress Solution or Feel Better in Five. They are widely available all over the world in paperback, ebook, and as audiobooks. So if that is something you want a bit of help in, they may be a good resource for you to use. If you enjoyed the show today, if you want to support the show, please do share the episode with your friends and family, and please consider leaving a review on whichever podcast platform you listen on. And of course, please do support the sponsors. You can see a full list with all the special offers at drchatterjee.com forward slash sponsors. Before we finish, I just want to let you know about Friday Five, my weekly newsletter that contains five short doses of positivity. It usually starts off with a practical tip for your health, but also various things such as books, articles, videos that I found inspiring. It could be a recipe that I'm making, a quote that's caused me to stop and reflect, basically anything that I feel would be helpful and uplifting. I get such wonderful feedback from my readers on this every week. And many of you tell me it is a wonderful way to finish off your week and get you set for the weekend. If that sounds like something you would like to receive each Friday, you can sign up for free at drchatterjee.com forward slash Friday 5. 
Thank you so much for listening. Have a wonderful week and please do press follow on whichever podcast platform you listen on. Remember, you are the architect of your own health. Making lifestyle changes always worth it because when you feel better, you live more. Thank you.